There you go. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. We got a lot of material today. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and open in, in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day and this opportunity we have to come together for your word. And we th ask, Lord, as we um, look at your word, that the, the that our focus is on Christ and the pictures you have for us of Christ in in numbers. Help us to see, Lord, your great and marvelous work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I mentioned last week, I forgot the slideshow. We talked, you know, Exodus ended chapter 40 with the erection, the establishment of the tabernacle. And this is kind of an artist rendition, but just pause. Everything and anything you're going to see is just that. It's an artist's rendition of what they read <clears throat> and perceive. We don't actually know the actual designs, but it's more of a conceptual thing to kind of get a picture or sight in your mind of when you read through Exodus and it talked about the gold and the bronze and the, and the structures. It's, it's just kind of an idea to, to show you of what it looked like. So you have this tabernacle, and you see, you know, there's a court, and then there was a brazen altar, there was a laver, or a washing bowl, and then there was a, a the tabernacle proper is back there, and that's where all the, the worship, the priestly duties were fulfilled. Okay, next one. Cal? Cal, can we, next slide. This is a kind of a picture, a zoomed in picture of, of the things. When you read it and it talks about uh, the coverings, the tapestry, you see multiple, level, multiple, multiple levels that covered the area. Because remember, this is a tent. And it moved on the wilderness march. Okay? And, and it remained, quote unquote, in place until Solomon a thousand years later. Okay? And it was only because David said, your, your ark is in a tent, and I'm going to build you something permanent. Uh, next slide. So this is kind of a layout, and, and notice the, the, as it was laid out in the court, you came by the, the bottom is the, uh, the, the fire pit where they offered the burnt sacrifice. The next is the water where they would wash. And each of these is a picture of Christ. The first thing on that altar burnt was the burnt sacrifice, a picture of Christ's total commitment and giving. The water, which is, you know, Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me, right? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us all our unrighteousness. We need to continually go back to him and get cleansed. We're done. And then you have the pictures of the light of the world. You have the altar of incense and you have the showbread. And then you have what we call the ark. But really, it's the ark is the bottom, and the very top, we'll look at it, is the mercy seat. Can we go to the next one? This is the, the picture. This is the, the when you picture. describe it, that's basically, what, it's it, that's fire basically what it's a big fire pit. Notice the staves or the Notice poles. Notice the staves or the poles. Because, because it was carried, it was by, carried certain Levites. by certain Levites. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. On the journey. On the journey. It was always carried. It was always all these carried. Articles, all these articles are carried. are carried. Next one. That's another picture. Again, it's an artist's rendition, but you get the idea. They start the fire, they put the, the offering on the grate, and it's burned up. And then as they move, they clear out the ashes. Next one. This is a kind of a rendition of the, the labor, the, the bowl that held the water for the ceremonial washing that always happened. And then we got the next one, which is the candle that lit the holy place. And then we did a, there's a whole series on this, but the, the idea is who is the light of the world? Jesus. Jesus, right? It's made of gold, speaks of his deity. Okay. Next one. And that's the altar of incense. Again, see the staves? The idea is it's carried. When they marched, they carried it. And we'll go to the next one. That's the showbread and the you know, who's the bread of life? Jesus. Jesus. That's the picture. Okay? And again, carried. And it's made of gold. It's made of gold. Or overlaid in gold. Next one. Now that's the picture, the rendition of it. The box on the bottom is the actual ark. The top of the two cherubims of the angels is called the mercy seat. And it's between the angels is where God's uh, glory appeared. And he met with, with Moses or the high, Aaron, the high priest, as it were. Okay? I think that's the last slide, is it not? Oh, no. Next slide. 
When you read the description of the priest's outfit, this is kind of what it would look like. The tapestry, all the things are representative. Okay? You have the, on the left is their day-to-day -day workings, on the right was a high priest. Okay? When he would go into the place. He carried the, the names of the Israelites on his chest, those 12 squares, as well as on his shoulders. Okay? The priest's job was a burden for the nation. He represented them to God. He pleaded for them. He offered the sacrifice for them, as well as himself. And then the final one, I think, one more. That's kind of another rendition where each stone, as it's laid out, had, had the name. They weren't written in English. Okay, just telling you that. That is not what it looked like, but it kind of gives you a representation. Okay? Yeah, I think that, is that it? I think that's the last one. Yeah, that's the last one. That's it. Okay. I, I wanted to bring that last week as we were kind of more into that study. You should have the reading program for next week. There's a lot going on. I gave you two other um, outlines. This one last week I told you I was going to bring you that kind of got cut off, but I made sure it printed out. It shows you the, the lineage of the tribes, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, and then 12, the 12 sons of, of Israel. And it kind of gives you a reference. You'll also see in here kind of my version of, we'll look at today, the outline, the, the, the setup of the camp. Okay? It's again just a reference. As you read it, just as a, a note for everybody, if you remember on the first reading program, I had a little asterisk. And I said, basically, it's a bunch of genealogies. It's an opportunity for light reading. And as you, if you read this week, you got to a number of sections where 12 times, except for the names, everything else remained the same. Okay? And so the point is, you, you get the picture. There was 12, and they all were committed. That's the real picture you have. The, the leader of the tribe, they brought instruments. They brought offerings. And it was repeated. There was an organization of the camp. There was a census of the camp. This kind of gives you, kind of gives you a visual of re the, that, those redundant long sections, which we're not going to cover in detail. Okay? So, this week we started in Numbers. We've moved fast. We're through Exodus. The temple has been established. Okay? Now, in chapter 1 of Numbers, um, they've been uh, in Sinai for about 10 months. The temple, temple's been erected because it says on the first of the second month of the second year. So this is exactly one month after the tabernacle's been established. There's a lot of things going on. And what you've got is uh, a group of people who are slaves, whose God has delivered from Egypt and is going to form them into a nation form them and organize them and build an army. I think that's one of the things to catch. Um, if you think about it, how God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt by his strong arm, he said. He, they, what did they do? Nothing. Nothing. Well. They just went out when God said go out. Okay. When the opportunity, when, the, when God opened the door, he said, here's how it's going to happen. I'm going to take the firstborn. You put the blood on the post. If you're obedient in that, then you can walk out. You do nothing but be obedient and walk out. Now he's going to take him into the promised land. Could not God have exercised that same power that he did against Egypt, against the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and all the rest of the Canaanites? Could, he could have, right? But he didn't. Okay? You know why? He wanted their obedience. He wanted to know they would obey. He wanted their obedience. Now, the other side, see, if God is always doing everything, then he becomes whose servant? <coughs> Ours. Right? And that's what he's on. He's going to form him in a nation. Who's going to have to go fight the battle? The nation. They're going to have to be obedient, and it's a test. We're going to get to this. And that's what he's doing. And, and in our own lives, we... And I, I use this example as kind of, you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek. But look, people are struggling with things in life, and oftentimes they're praying for this miracle when God has provided the human means by which to fulfill that need. 
Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to, you can pretty much write this one down. If God has provided the mechanism to means humanly for you to get what you need, don't go praying for a miracle because I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get it. Because that's slothfulness and that's laziness. You know, you got to, what do you got to do to get a crop? Farmers? What do you, first thing you got to do? Plant it, harvest it. Plant it before you can harvest it. So God says, oh, provide it. Well, there's the field, there's the grain. What do you got to do? Get out of bed and go plant it. Okay? Now, if you're on a wilderness journey for God somewhere, he'll provide for you, right? But that's the picture. He's forming him into a nation to go fight a battle. Okay? And on this side, remember, he's using slaves to defeat established armies who are in fortified cities. There's a great picture there. Um, so during this month, the tabernacle has been established. God has set apart the priest and consecrated them uh, for their duties and their functions. Okay? And then they celebrated the first Passover. Um, and and um, we'll get that. Um, from the record in Numbers 10, 11, there were only nine, okay, from where we're at to, to Numbers 10, 11, it'll be 19 days when God says, let's break camp, we're all set, and let's head to the promised land. I, want, I think there's some significance to this timing. Numbers comes in, tabernacle's established, Things are all in order. Now, God just is going to spend the next 19 days of getting all the organization in place for this mob of probably a couple million people to move and take a couple weeks' journey, probably, to the promised land. <clears throat> See, in God's eye, mind, if you follow God's plan, you're going to have the reward. But in this, there are tests. And there are challenges. And it really is to show the heart of the people. I'm going to say this. The test that God brings to your life is not to God, for God to figure you out. He knows you. And it's because he knows you, he confronts you with the various uh, uh, tests. Because what, he, what is he looking for? Obedience. Well, yeah, he's looking for obedience, but see, the problem is, we, we don't really see ourselves in the light that God sees us. We generally see more ourselves in, let us say, a more favorable light compared to God than I think God does. And I, I believe that all these tests come for us to see what's really in us. Not, and I also mean that in a positive sense. I can tell you through certain trials in my life that having gone through them, you realize that God has shown you what was in you that you may not have believed you, were, you had that in you to do what God has called you to do. Okay? So, um, while they're there, the first thing he does is he does a census. God says, we, gotta, we have a mob, and we're going we're gonna to count them. And he, 14 times, he says, I want to get all the men, 20 years and older and upward, who are able to go to war. Okay? There's your pacifist people. There's your answer. There's battles to be fought in this world. And our battle's not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. Unfortunately, oftentimes, they exhibit themselves in the human flesh. And so they're going to go to battle. Now, if you remember the Genesis account when God talked to Abraham, and he told them they were going to be strangers in Egypt, as it were, for 400 years, what he said to them, he said, because the sins of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the, the uh, Jebusites, uh, the, the, the para, the, all those cunt nations is yet, yet not fulfilled. God gave those nations 400 years to repent. Okay? And when they didn't, God then sent in Israel to do his bidding, which was to judge them. Okay? So he's preparing them for war. He gets 603,550 men. Now, God instructed Moses not to count the Levites. Okay? So that's just of the 12 tribes without the Levites. 12 tribes because Joseph has Ephraim and Manasseh. Okay? 603,000. Um, when and we have the numbers are in the picture. And then he organized the camp. To the east, he had Judah, Ishkar, and Zebulon. To the south, around the tabernacle, was Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. To the west was Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. And on the north was Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. 
okay? So he's got the camp, my picture, you know, organized. And in there I gave you the counts of the, the tribes. And each, each of these tribes, the three to the east, were under the leadership of Judah. The north was under Dan. And, and we get that because when it was time to move out, those were the ones that led first with the standards. It was just an or, a very organized thing. See, God is not a God of chaos. He is a God of order. Do you see that in his establishment of leadership? He chooses Moses, and we'll look at this. He chooses Aaron, and he does not put up well with rebellion. Okay? So he's organized a camp, and he expects him to do what? Follow his plan. Follow his plan. Thank you. Do it exactly. Remember what he told Moses in Exodus when he was telling him how to build the thing? See to it that you do everything exactly as it has been shown you. And then uh, when they built it and they made it, it says over and over again, they did exactly as God had instructed. Okay? That's how God works. So in chapter 3, we then get the census of, um, of the Levites. And he wants, now, when he counted the men of war, they were 20 and older. Okay? Now, I'm not going to belabor the point, but there's a, uh, there, you'll see later that when they rebel, it's those who are 20 and older who don't go into the promised land. The picture being, it seems like, before 20, God was saying they had a special grace. Okay? But when he comes to the Levites, he starts counting them from one month of age and older. Okay? And again, I gave you the counts. There's three sons of Levi, right? Originally, there's Merari, Gershon, and Koath. And that's how we organized them, under those families. We got their numbers. And I think it's 20, uh, 14, 8, 21, 3, you know, like roughly around 22,000 Levites. And if you look at the numbers, they're really the smallest of the tribes about. Really small group. Um, now in this, we have Aaron, the high priest, and his two sons. If you, if you look at the layout, it was Moses, Aaron, and his sons were at the east of the tabernacle. They basically were the guards of the opening to the tabernacle in, in, around it. And then the priests were around the tabernacle, and around the priests were the nations. It, there's a whole picture there of God in a structure of, of responsibilities, okay? Now, God gave Levi, the Levites to Aaron for the service of the tabernacle because who's, who's the one, we say in the culture world, in, in, in charge, but really what we're saying is who is God put, made responsible for what goes on in that tabernacle? Aaron. Aaron, you know, this is, this is a military jargon we hear. As an officer, you're responsible for everything your troops do and do not do. That's just, if you don't want that, then go on home, right? They, they beat you. you. Everything that happens, whether you, you knew about it or not, you're responsible for it. Aaron, you're over this tabernacle. You're responsible for everything that happens in there. And he's going to repeat this to him. And for that, I gave, gave you the Levites to do it. There's a lot of things that have to be done. When it comes to the breaking of camp and the setting up of camp, it was the Levites who did it. Nobody else got to do that, right? Now, I gave you the, break, uh, the breakout here, and then <clears throat> uh, in, as they organized around it, Koath, who the priest, they were responsible for all the articles we looked at. They, they were responsible for carrying them. And God was very, really, um, he stressed this point. Everything that is of God was to be treated holy. Anybody know what the consequences or the failure to do that were was? Yeah. Death. That's how seriously God takes his holiness and us in reverence of him. You know when he says, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain? He is really serious about that. Really serious. And anybody who would not, who, who thought they could step out of... What God had said was exhibiting a, what kind of a spirit? Rebellion. Rebellion. We're going to see that. So the Koath carried all those articles. The Gershons, they carried all the, 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 the draping, the curtains, and the ropes, and all that. And then the, the Merari's carried all the heavy, they did all the heavy lifting. They carried all the boards. If you remember that, 
There were boards, there were, sta there were sockets, there were all these heavy things about the building. Now we know from Exodus that the 12 tribe, leaders of the 12 tribe brought six carts for carrying it. So they didn't, they didn't lug these, you know, these uh, big pieces of lumber that were like, I think, a foot and a half wide and like however tall they were. They didn't lug them on their shoulders. They loaded them up in carts and they were pulled by oxen, but they, they were responsible for them. And God said, there's a whole way you do it. And that's, you know, four, chapter four was the ministries. Here's what you're going to do, and here's how you're going to do it. And who's responsible to make sure it happened that way? Aaron. Aaron. Aaron and his two sons. We see, we see uh, responsibility. We also see delegation, because the, the thing about it, the three of them couldn't do it by themselves, could they? No. Mm -hmm. Even, even the Coas, when it came time to cover the, co the ark and, and the mercy seat, were not permitted to look upon it. They had to, they had to take the, temp, the, the, the curtain down and take it over backwards and drape it, and then cover it. And they were told, be careful not to touch it. Okay? God was serious about it. <clears throat> now, once the tabernacle is erected, we see the presence of God appears. Um... And it would be a cloud over the tabernacle by day. And at night it would be a pillar of fire. Um, and, and the movement of the cloud was God's commandment to the nation to move out. If the cloud stayed where it was at, then they stayed. Sometimes days, sometimes weeks, and sometimes months. We'll find out eventually. But the, the direction they had was God gave them a visible command in that he would, the cloud would move. And when the cloud moved, God gave them a whole order. First, first went the ark, Moses, and then the trumpets were blown, and then the east came out, which was you know Judah and, and his group, and and they would follow with the, the implements of the, the tabernacle, and then the next group, and then the next group. It was all in order, all in order. They moved very efficiently, very 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 efficiently. And when it came to, they would move until the, the uh, cloud would stop. And that's where they would establish everything. So they had the visible means. Um, in, in Numbers 9.22 it says, Whether it was two days or a month or a year, the cloud lingered over the tabernacle, stayed above it. The sons of Israel remained camp. It did not set out. But when it lifted, they did set out. At the command of the Lord they camped. At the command of the Lord they set out. They kept the Lord's charge according to the command of the Lord through Moses. We're to have that today. <clears throat> We're to have that in the Holy Spirit. See, what happened was every day they got up and they looked and they said, where am I going, God? And, you know, it's a good picture for us. Don't just jump out of bed and charge out the door. Take the time to let the Lord lead and direct. And they always were checking. What if, the, what if God in the middle of the day decided to move? They had a process. They had to be, on, they had to be attentive to and watching for. And that's where we have in chapter 10, we have the silver trumpets, okay? And we have the, the, the problem is, there's trouble on the way. First we're given this, the trumpets, and the picture was the, the assembling, the organizing, and the moving was orchestrated by the trumpets. In other words, God, see that Moses would pick up that this, the, the, uh, the glory of God is moving, the cloud, so the order would go out is to get everybody together and get ready to move. There were times when he would want to, God would say, you could bring them, assemble them, and they would blast the trumpet, and everybody would come, the leaders would come, and you know, they basically disseminate information this way. He also says that silver trumpets are gonna be used later when they go into battle, okay? It's kind of the picture, as they go into battle, what is the trumpet signifying? It's a picture of, it's a, like a calling on the Lord, we're doing your battle, we're being faithful, we need you to fight our battle. Because the last thing you want to do is go into the, the Lord's battle of your own strength. You're going to lose. And you'll see that. You're going to see that a couple times <clears throat> in numbers. You're going to see this. Um, so they grab up and they've got all these instruments and they start moving out. In chapter 10, verse 11, they set out for the promised land. They break the camp and they begin to move out. Just as they were told. But as they get to uh, the chapter... They're only having manna, and the people 
um, begin to complain. What are they complaining about? Anybody know? Anybody read it? What was the complaint when they, all we got is manna? No meat. No meat. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, when God has graciously provided for you, my suggestion, accept it happily. Don't start complaining. Because I see in here, we're, I, I don't know, I read this, and um, there's a sense to me that you know, God's like, you want, you want meat? You want meat? Uh, he says, you're going to get meat. You're going to get meat so much, you're going to loathe the meat. You ever had that? Where some, you ate something so much so often, or you ate something that got you really sick and you never want it again? Huh? Am I the only one? Right? We've all probably had that. Well, that's what happens. He says, you're going to want, and, and in here is a great line, because God, God tells Moses when he comes that the people are complaining, and God says, oh, I'm going to give you meat. And, and Moses like, we haven't got enough cattle, we haven't got enough uh, goats and sheep, how are we going to get it all? And God says, is the, is, has the Lord's arm gotten short? Is your, or Lord's arm short? Can he? You know, and what happens? He raises up a wind, and guess what shows up? Bunch of quail. It says, says that they were, it, now, it, some, it, you, you can read it like they were stacked two feet high, or two cubits high, which is three feet. Or it seems like really what it was is the quail, as they're listed as quail, nobody's really sure, but the, the, the winged fowl were like this high off the ground, which is an easy bag. And they were a day's journey out. Think about it. What it is is God has provided this. If you're not happy with it, it's out there. Go get it. What does that show? Again, it's rebellion. God says, here it is. Where's the... Where's the manna? It's right there. All they got to do is go pick it up. But out there, a day's journey, they have to go out and pick it up. It just shows you the heart of man. It's just, I don't care what God's giving me. I want this. You think, well, here's how you read it. Because when it says they got the quail, as it, it was in their mouth before they ate it, God struck them with a plague. Now, was that because they were rebellious? Or was it likely that they were so set on their carnal desire that they didn't listen to God because God had provided the meat and he said you're going to eat it for 30 days but remember when he told them in Exodus whenever you're going to eat meat what did you have to do to the animal drain the blood it may be that the people this is what I read is I got it I got the impression that the people got their the dove the quail and they didn't do what God had said and as they ate it God judged them because a whole lot of people died there's a great picture. Don't complain when God has graciously provided you that which is good enough. Why do you complain with what God has provided you? Well, it's because their hearts. Where was their heart? What was driving their heart? They weren't spirit. Paul talked to the Corinthians. You're not, you're not spiritual. You're carnal. Right? How many people ruin their lives because they don't take what God has given them? The proverbial grass is greener on the other side. And they find out emptiness, right? They go after it, and they lose what God has given them, right? Maybe you have a job. It's not the greatest job. You, you find out that all oh, this, you know, they're making more money or whatever. And you, you leave this job, and you, then you start bouncing around not finding anything. People do it in relationships, right? Um, <clears throat> Proverbs, God says... In Proverbs 5, enjoy, uh, play, give yourself pleasure in the wife of your youth. And how many men ruin their lives looking at greener grass? And then they find out that it's all, they lose what they had, and they lost what they thought they were getting. Proverbs talks about that. Um, <clears throat> so the people have complained. There's a reoccurring, um, what's the word I want to use for Theme, reoccurring theme in numbers. And what you see is God has graciously, and the people complained. God has graciously, and people murmured. God has graciously, and the people were angry. What, what's the picture? They're never satisfied. They're never satisfied. You'll ne you will never be satisfied with your life or what is in your life when you are carnal. It's never big enough, shiny enough, special enough, 
or permanent enough to satisfy you if you are carnally minded. If you're spiritually minded, the same things that the carnal mind loathes, you will be happy in. It didn't matter what God did for them, <clears throat> how many times he moved miraculously for them. That's why God doesn't save by miracles, okay? You don't need to go any further than this account, the, the account of Exodus and here in Numbers, to look at the miracles that God performed and yet find out that people's hearts were just as hard, just as carnal as before. The miracles did nothing for them because it was their flesh. Remember, Jesus did this. He fed the 5,000, and they came. They said, we want you. Well, he said, you only want me because I fed you. And he said, well, give us the bread Moses gave him. Jesus said, Moses didn't give him any bread. Who gave him the bread? God. My father. You guys missed it. You still miss it, is what he's telling them. Okay? The miraculous never serve to save people. Okay? It's God's grace. He does work in that way. But it's not going to change a carnal mind. Matter of fact, what did, at the end of his book, the gospel, John said, these are written that you might do what? Believe that Jesus is the Christ. He goes, there's so many more miracles that John says, I don't suppose all the books in the world could, record, could have recorded all the miracles of Jesus. Now, it takes you to be in the 19th or 20th century sitting in some stuffy <coughs> library to write, out, write the miracles of Christ off as, as bogus. But at the time when John wrote that, there was no question about the miracles that Christ did. In fact, that was one of the reasons that this, the high priest said, we need to get rid of this guy or everybody's going to go after him because why? His miracles. And he says, believe me for my works. If not, if not for my words, believe me for my works. I'm demonstrating I am who I am. But would they believe the works? No, because if they wouldn't believe what Jesus said... They were not about to believe what Jesus did. Because what when they were really confronted with it, who did they claim or ascribe the miracles of Christ to? Anybody remember? Who? Satan. Satan. In other words, how, in other words the, the human mind, I don't want to accept Christ. I'm going to find a reason not to accept Christ. And that's what the people have. Now in chapter 12, we have a problem. We've got the people complaining. And now... From his own household, Moses' older sister and brother complain against him. It says that uh, Moses uh, married an Ethiopian woman. Now there's a whole lot of things. Did, did, did uh, his wife die? Or is this really talking about his wife like he gave preference to her? What we know is God says Moses was married and Miriam didn't like it. She took her, her, her brother Aaron along with her for the ride. We get that because first she's listed first. It was Miriam and Aaron, and it was Miriam who God struck with leprosy. And in both cases, what happened is people who were in positions of authority under God, Miriam was a prophetess, God had used her, um, again challenged the, right, the dutifully, the rightfully um, appointed man of God. And this is again rebellion. You see, if you watch this, you see the people, of, the, the people unwittingly being used by Satan trying to cause disruption and chaos in the camp. <clears throat> uh, it was the murmurings of Miriam against Moses, and, it, uh, and Aaron followed along. Again, in, Mar in Aaron, I think here's a great picture. Um, Mary, uh, Aaron, this isn't his first failure, is it? Remember what happened with the golden calf? He succumbed to the pressure of the people. And here we have Aaron succumbing to the complaining of his, his sister. Okay? Uh, it says that Aaron wasn't perfect. It says Aaron has some character flaws. That is maybe why God chose the younger brother Moses over Aaron. But they went along and Miriam gets struck with leprosy. And then they repent. Moses prays and God heals him. But he says, but if, I think he says, if, Mo, if, if, uh, if Marion's father had spit in her face, she'd still be outside the camp for seven days. She, but he's saying basically, your, her challenge to Moses was akin to spitting in God's face. A complete insult. 
So he says, you can go sit outside the camp for seven days, Miriam, and you can think about it. And we're not going anywhere. So think about it. Seven days, everybody's in the camp and nobody's moving, and they all know why. Okay? And what it is is they challenged Moses. Okay? And it wasn't Moses that complained, if you read the story. God heard it, and he came down to Moses and said, get Miriam and Aaron over here. And we're going to see, if we read on, we're going to pretty much, they weren't just kibitzing in the tent by themselves. They were out talking among other people. Again, this is rebellion. <clears throat> um, okay, now when we get to chapter 13 and 14, we have rebellion um, that leads to lost opportunity. Um, in chapter 13, we have the sending in of the 12 spies to the land. Now this was in, uh, this was in uh, Moses acquiescing to the complaint or the cry of the people. They were supposed to go in. God was going to lead them by the cloud. And they said, whoa, 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 before we go, let, let's go look and see what we're getting into. It's just a picture that the people were walking by sight, not by faith. The spies go in. I think you all know the story. And 10 of the 12 come back with a bad report, right? And what happened? Not to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. They turned everybody against Moses, against God. Okay? And now you have Joshua and Caleb, two guys who stood up and said, no, no, we're more than able. All we've got to do is believe God. Mm -hmm. And God pronounced a judgment. He said, because what they said is, oh, God doesn't care about us or our children or our wives. And they're all going to die. And God says, no, here's what's going to happen. You're going to die in the wilderness. Your children are going to enter in the promised land, what you've refused. And it was all those who were 20 and older. And here's what something I picked up was, if you go back and think about your reading, you've read in Exodus and at the tabernacle, how much, you know, remember they, they were giving so much gold and, and silver and all the other things, they had to say, whoa, stop, that's enough. And then at the dedication, you had 12 days in a row where the 12 leaders brought uh, carts of, of gifts for God and for the tabernacle, and they brought all this stuff. And this is a picture of, oh, I'm really, really dedicated to you, Lord. It was all in the flesh because as soon as they were put to the test, what did they do? They failed. Okay? It's just an interesting dynamic to me. They all made these great professions, and here they are given the chance to put their faith in action, and they do what? Fail. They fail. They shrink back. Okay? So then God says, you're going to wander, and wander they did. Now, if you've read it, if you did your reading, outside of in... Um, the uh, 33rd chapter of uh, Deuteronomy, the, the numbers, there, there's, there's no record of what happened in those 40 years. There's a log in chapter 33 of where they went and what, you know, in time, you know, that kind of a thing. But there's no details. We only have incidents. And we have an incident here. Shortly thereafter, we have somebody decides that he needs to be the top dog. His name is Korah. And this is, this is amazing to me. God has just dealt with Miriam and Aaron's rebellion against Moses. And then Korah, who's of the Korathites, who is a priestly line, he decides he needs to, he needs to have that, sh that position of Moses. And he brings along with him the two leading sons of Reuben, who being the first, you know, the first son, kind of feel like they've been, you know, they've, that should be theirs. But we saw from Jacob, their father burned that up with his instability. And uh, they come and they challenge God, and they get 250 other uh, leaders to, uh, to come. You know, this, here's a picture. Whenever you have someone who has a thirst for power, a hunger for control, a, a desire to dominate, okay, it's the worst of mankind. Because they, all they are about is their own self-glorification. Moses didn't want this, did he? Mm -mm. He tried to get out of it, didn't he? But God called him to it. But Korah, he wants it. You know, be, be careful what you ask for, right? Now, when God saw this rebellion, he moved really quickly. He, he, and, and Moses in this is like, we've already dealt with this. And if it's going to come up again, God's going to deal really sternly. And what he did is he basically 
call down the people. You make a choice. If you're with the Lord, get on this side. Otherwise, get away from those people. And he goes, so you can know that God is against Korah and those in his rebellion. Um, if they die like other men, then God's not mad. But if the earth opens up and swallows them up, well, that's what happened. And actually, the Bible says they went straight to Sheol, to hell. And it wasn't just them. It was everything of theirs, including their families. Okay? Then what happened is the people all ran away and said, the earth is going to swallow us all up. And then God sent fire out, and the 250 other leaders who had joined Korah, God consumed them. You get a picture that God does not accept rebellion. In Samuel, he says, rebellion as a, is as... Anybody know? What does he like rebellion to in Samuel when he tells Saul that he's lost his kingdom? He said, rebellion is as witchcraft. It's of the devil. And that's what God says. He, he, he dealt with it. What's crazy is, it shows you the influence of a malefactor, a, a usurper. See, he had convinced the people, he would got them behind him. This is a work of Satan. Just like Absalom later with his father David. He turned the people's heart against David. They loved David. David was a great king. But they, they, were, they were like sheep. They got led astray. Because the next morning after Korah is de uh, destroyed, the people come against Moses and said, you've killed the God, man of God. Was he a man of God? No. No, no God answered he wasn't a man of God. And what did he do? Well, that's, that's, he sent a plague and 14,700 people died. And then God established, affirmed in chapter 17, Aaron. That was the, uh, you heard of this, they, they bring, he had the, the 12 leaders bring their, um, their staff, which was their signet. It's a, it's a, I always look at it like a walking stick. And um, they put him in the, the tabernacle overnight. And what happened to Aaron's? Yeah, it's a picture of the resurrection. It blossomed, it bloomed, and produced almonds. Okay? What he was saying is, that's the one I've chosen. When God says, that's the one I've chosen, you know what he's saying is? How would he tell about Huh? Listen. Listen to him. Don't mess with him. Because if he messes up, he talks to me, not you. Okay. Right? Don't mess with him. He's mine. Um, chapter 18, he gives out the responsibilities and the, the uh, priest's portion. Again, he's just laying out, he's getting them organized. Here's the sad thing. That's, that's the account because now we get to chapter 20. <laughs> And it opens with the people stayed at Kadesh. Well, that's where they rebelled. That's when he said go in the land and they wouldn't go in and they said you're going to be in the wilderness 40 years. We're now about 38 years on and we're back to the place we started. You've gone nowhere. And that's really where it's at with us. If God calls us and we don't obey, we're going to be right where we're at until God, we, we're ready to move with God. And, and the next part is you have a simple statement that says, now, Miriam died there and was buried there. That's it. End of her record. Uh, she had murmured against God. It was Moses, but it was really God. And uh, now, we're not told if she was one of those that refused to enter the, the, the promised land. Okay? But we do know that she rebelled against Moses and God's authority, and she doesn't enter the promised land, and she dies. And in 38 years, the people haven't changed um, they're complaining just as much. And the problem is, if Kadesh, if you remember, there was water, strike the rock, the water came out. Now we're back here 38 years later, and guess what they're doing? Complaining again. And God says to them, what is he supposed to do with the rock this time? Speak, Speak to the rock. Moses and Aaron were pretty upset with the people. They let their flesh get in the way, and they said, must we get you water? And then they struck the rock twice. Anybody know what the rock is to represent? Christ. Christ. Christ is to be struck once. Romans 6, 9, and 10. He, he raised, he dies no more. The death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. There was a picture. that the, the rock had been struck and it provided living water. Now it's just a case of speaking. Idea. Christ has died. Now you just need to call him. All that call on the Lord will be saved. 
Well, because of this, unfortunately, God tells Moses, you're not going in. We look at that and go, that's pretty harsh. Here's the key. God says this. I will be treated as holy. Moses, you didn't do that. You didn't put my glory before your anger. Again, for us, that's a great picture. When we lose our temper, we do not glorify God. It does, James, it does not produce the righteousness of God, does it? No. Well, with this, they, they get their water, and then what happens? Well, it ends with Aaron dying, and that's, that's the end of it. That's kind of the end of that part. And as we come to it, we get to chapter 21 through 25, and now we deal with some, some victories. They get some victories against some enemies, their first battles. <coughs> the first time... Um, they, they fight the Canaanites who launched an unprovoked attack against them. So they went and they said, God, if you give us a victory, we'll go wipe them out. And God said, go for it. And they went in and wiped them out. And then later, uh, they come up on a, a group of people, the Amorites, who say, we're just going to attack them. Uh, because what it was, they said, hey, can we pass through the land? We won't touch anything. It's just a shortcut. And they're like, not only no, but we're going to come down and destroy you. And God gave them a victory. Those two victories, those accounts, bookend um, the people complaining again that God had abandoned them. In Romans, uh, Numbers 21, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Now, they've been out there 38 years, and have they died? No. Nope. No, people are dying, but they're not dying. People are not dying because they don't have water or food. God has provided everything. Well, in 21.6, the next verse, God responds complete, com, com, to their complaint by sending what? Serpents. In. And when the people acknowledged their sin, God told Moses to make a, bron a brazen bronze serpent and put on a pole that anyone who looks to it would be healed. And in John 3.14, Jesus likens himself to that. That's a picture of Christ. Christ had to be lifted up. That Whoever looks on him, the idea is looks to him for salvation, will have it. Be healed. That's a picture. Now the last three verses, we're in on time, of, of Numbers 22, 23, and 24 deal with the story of Balaam. Now I, I suspect you probably, a lot of you know the story of Balaam. Balaam, Peter says he was a prophet. Now there's a lot of writing. Was he a prophet that kind of went off the way of, of, uh, of uh, filthy lucre, as Peter calls it, for gain, and God, he abandoned God for whatever he could get? Or was he just somebody God used at, in this point? But what happens, Balak, who's a Moabite, sees the Israelites coming and goes, they're going to come and destroy us. Because we heard what they did to the Canaanites, the Amalekites. But actually, God had told Moses to leave the Moabites alone. You're not going to bother the Moabites. Because who are the Moabites? Anybody remember? Who was their dad? Lot. 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 <laughs> so they're your brother. Because Lot was the nephew of... Abraham. So he said, leave him alone. But Balak doesn't believe that or doesn't know it. And he wants to get Balaam to curse him. And they go to him and, and, and God appears to Balaam and says, what are these guys doing here? And he tells him and he goes, no, no, no. You're not going to go with them. Just send them away. You're not going to curse Israel because they're blessed of me. Okay? See, God knows Balaam's heart. What does Balaam want? Anybody know? Money. Money. Thank you. It's all about the dollar. So he tells them, they go back to Balak, and then they come back with a bigger offer. And it's funny because Balaam puts, is very pious. He says, oh, the Lord said I can't go. I wouldn't go. You ready for this? If you filled my house with gold and silver. <coughs> wink, wink. You know what is he saying? More money. More money, I'm going. And God, he, he, he tells him, why don't you guys stay here the night? I'll go see what God has said. Now, does he need to see what God has said? No. Nope. No, because God has already told him, has he not? Mm -hmm. Do you see a picture or type for you and I in there? See, if God has told you no, do you know what the answer is? No. You do not need to go back and ask him again. Because what you have to worry about is you get an answer like Balaam, where God gives you over to your devices and brings you get what you want, but he brings leanness to your soul. Because this time God says, go ahead. Now, is he giving him approval? 
No. No. What he's saying is, I know you're going to go anyhow. Because if you want to know if God wanted to go, what happened? The Bible says the angel of the Lord, which is a pre-incarnate Christ, Christ was in the way, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Three times, Balaam's donkey tried to turn away. And each time, Balaam got angry and he struck him. Finally, the donkey just lays down. And just as he's going to clobber the, the, the donkey, the donkey says, why are you hitting me? And Balaam, which blows me away, answered him. Right? <clears throat> and then God opens Balaam's eyes and he sees Christ, the angel of the Lord, standing there with a sword. And God says, buddy, if that donkey hadn't laid down, I'd have killed him. <laughs> I want to let you know, when I say no, you know what that means? No. 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 You don't come back and have to ask me again. You don't need, okay, world picture. You have everything you need to life and godliness in, the, in, the, in this book. There are some gray areas for sure. But I'm going to quote Alistair Begg, uh, a pastor in Cincinnati, uh, Cleveland. The main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. You know, we have the, the Ten Commandments as instructions in life. You don't need to go ask God if you should violate one of those, if it's okay to violate one of them. Because you know what the answer is? No. 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 <laughs> and if you find covetousness in your heart, that's a sin. You've got to deal with it. God said if you're angry in your heart, you've committed murder. If you're angry in your heart, you don't need to ask God. Now you can go tell him, say, I'm really angry and I need to get over this. Jesus said if you lust after someone, you've done what? Sin. You've already committed adultery. If it's in your heart, you better go confess it. You don't need to ask God. He's already given your answer. Just because opportunity presents itself and affords you the opportunity and you can pursue it, does not mean God's approving of it. Well, Balaam went that way. And then what's happening is, we'll end with this, is that he goes out and Balak says, all right, go ahead and curse him. And every time out of Balaam's mouth comes blessing and blessing. And Balak gets angry and they go and they set up altars and they make offerings hoping to change God's mind and God doesn't do it. So finally Balaam gets done and he says, well, here's what's going to happen to you and your people. And he lays out the prophecy. Balak is not happy. I paid you all this money. You bless him and you curse me. But the worst thing that Balaam did was as he left, we know this from other writings, he says, well, I couldn't curse him, but if you want to bring in a uh, judgment against these people, here's what you do. You send your women down there, and you have them commit adultery and fornication, and God will judge them. And then we're, we read a little bit later in Numbers 23. Um, wait a minute, and uh, where's it go to? Numbers 31 says, Behold, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, so the plague was among the congregation. Numbers 31 8, they killed the kings of Midian along with the rest who were slain. And he lists them, and then he says, also killed Balaam the son of Borat. He sinned. He was after money, but it led to his demise, and he was judged, and God struck him, and he, the Israelites killed him. He was responsible for his sins. But here's, we covered a lot today. And, um, but I think the picture there is the complaining came from not being content with, you know, Timothy, contentment with God and this is great gain. The problem was the people were very carnal and they were never content. And in that they continually sinned against God. And God is a God of grace, but there's also that point where God says enough is enough. That should be a warning to all of us to, to you know, as we used to say in the, in the Navy, it's like, you mind your P's and your Q's. You pay attention. Keep a check on your heart. You know, Corinthians, take every thought captive. If you find a thought taking you away from God, get rid of that thought and come back to God. Because God does not accept or wink at sin. And again, rebellion is as witchcraft. And when you don't do what God says, you know what he calls that? Is disobedience or rebellion. Right. Let's end, end in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. And there's a great picture in the account of, of numbers. But we thank you, Lord, that in through all of this, you are more than faithful. That you always, always, <clears throat> though there was rebellion and though there was complaining, Lord, for those who were faithful, you always honored them. 
with blessings. And help us, Lord, to honor you with faithfulness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.